What's going on everybody and welcome to Rock and Roll True Stories and I had previously done a video on Alice in Chains' MTV Unplugged episode from 1996 but that one was more just about the performance itself. This video I want to talk about what happened behind the scenes and maybe talk about some stuff that you guys haven't heard before especially from some of the MTV people who were involved with the actual show. So there was a guy named Alex Coletti and he was a producer at MTV and he was involved pretty much with the whole MTV Unplugged series since its inception in 1989. So when it came time to go after Alice in Chains to do the show, he said they have the songs, they have the depth, and they have the emotion where you basically strip it down and you really find something there. There was just something going on and according to Coletti, it was MTV who approached the band even though the show took place in New York, the rehearsals actually began in Seattle, but they didn't go well initially. So Sean Kinney would tell journalist Greg Prado that it became more apparent that unless things seriously changed, then the band couldn't go out and play to their potential at this level at least. And he said, we can't even get through a week and a half without drama and scary stuff going on. That's about right when I mentally started preparing that it's done. Same thing with MTV Unplugged. They kept asking if we'd do it up to the moment it was a real nail biter. So barely any rehearsing at all. The guy's not showing up. Same stuff. We rolled out there and everything worked. Coletti corroborated Kinney's comments saying that there clearly was more going on behind the scenes than he was aware of. So Coletti claimed that one factor that was working in the band's favor was that at the time Alice in Chains wasn't touring, so it wasn't a huge inconvenience to have them on tour and then do an MTV Unplugged show. Now this was a huge advantage because for a lot of bands who did MTV Unplugged, um, they were used to playing giant stadiums or even playing uh, arenas. And uh, to go from playing that to scaling down their show and their set to something that's TV friendly and that's friendly to like a much smaller venue is often difficult for a lot of bands and requires a lot of time. Now Coletti recalled flying to Seattle and actually checking in on rehearsals and meeting the band and talking about the parameters of the show. Now the band had enlisted the help of a second guitarist, which was Scott Olson, uh, who also worked with Hart as well. Now Coletti recalled going to rehearsals and he remembers seeing Lane energetically walking into a room eating a bucket of chicken and greeting him saying, hey man, and his hands were covered in fingerless gloves and were greasy from eating the chicken. Now the band would travel to New York City in early April to prepare for the show which was scheduled to take place on April 10th, 1996 at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. So Toby Wright, who produced Jar of Flies, as well as the band's self-titled album, would return once again, and according to him, rehearsals went great. Now Coletti recalled a last-minute request to add lava lamps to the set from the band. It was a difficult request because the lava lamps needed to be heated and then turned on for quite a while before they're used. So if you guys pay particular attention to the show, you'll notice that some of the lava lamps aren't really moving a whole lot. And in Coletti's own words, they were very grungy looking, giving the set its proper appearance. So it ended up actually working out in their favor. Now there were several issues that the band was dealing with behind the scenes. So a guy named Randy Biro, who worked with the band as a guitar and bass tech, stated that both him and Lane were going through withdrawals at the time. So Biro had somebody bring some to him at the actual show, while Lane already had his own pre-cooked supply, which he tended to carry in an old glass pill bottle covered with a cork top. So according to Biro, Lane hadn't done enough to the point where he was nodding off or drooling, but he was right there before Lane went on the set, and he did some just before he went on, but he didn't do a lot, and he said he had enough, and no point did I see him run down to the bathroom or anything. Also adding complications was that Lane had dyed his hair pink, which forced the lighting director to match the background to his hair color. One thing the band did do that a lot of other bands were delayed in doing was that they did provide MTV with a set list ahead of time, making the lighting cues much easier to deal with. Also adding to complications were that Jerry Cantrell had food poisoning from a bad hot dog he had eaten earlier and they had to place a wastebasket next to him during the show. Biro recalled that once the band hit the stage and launched into Nutshell, a lot of people from the band's management team were in tears. Lane would also script the lyrics to Sludge Factory numerous times because the song is written about his conflict with the record label who was Sony and the heads of the label just happened to be sitting in the front row of the audience so maybe Lane was nervous. Now, Biro claimed that in between songs, there was a lot of clowning around with the audience, and even the band picked on Biro himself, referring to him as an effing Frenchman. Now, Coletti would look back at Unplugged and said that drummer Sean Kinney was the unsung hero of the show. 
Because according to him, the thing about Unplugged, especially with rock bands, is that you live or die by the drummer. If the drummer gets it and tempers his playing, then everyone can kind of play at a lower volume and play acoustically. And when the drummer just plays like a rock show, everyone turns up their monitors. And then what's meant to be this pretty acoustic thing just sounds like really loud electric guitars. So following the show, about two weeks after it happened, the band was finally sent a first cut to review and Lane wasn't happy. So he got producer Toby Wright to watch the Unplugged set from start to finish. And according to Coletti, Lane thought that MTV had edited the whole performance in the worst possible light to make Lane look bad. Coletti would take the notes back from Lane and Alice in Chains and re-edit the performance and finally get Lane's approval. So Coletti would recall, he was paying attention, but he looked like he was falling asleep at certain points or he'd nod out and then all of a sudden his part would come up and boom, he'd be there. But they'd show him sitting there with his eyes closed for several bars of music and then they wouldn't show him until it was time to sing. And then they'd cut to Jerry or Mike and it just looked like he was sleeping through the whole thing during the songs. So producer Toby Wright would provide MTV with the list of suggested changes until they finally made the corrections and Lane gave his approval. So I want to leave you guys with... Um, a, I want to leave you guys with an interview that Jerry Cantrell did recently with uh, Lars Ulrich. Uh, I used it in my other video, but I thought it was relevant to this one. So that concludes this video, guys. Thanks for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. And as always, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. And let me know which stories you'd like to see featured in future episodes on my channel. <laughs> we were doing the Unplugged in, uh, in New York. They all showed up, all four of the guys. They're all sitting in a row and they all had these new short haircuts and stuff. It was pretty funny. So Mike wrote some stuff on his base about friends not letting friends get friends haircuts. They were all GQ looking and cleaned up and stuff. Metallica is all about music, not the length of our hair. We've heard the word words sell out, you know, from way back. Nowadays, I, 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 I welcome it. Come with me with what you got. Yes, we sell out every seat in the house, every time we play, anywhere we play. Get friends, friends haircuts. haircuts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so all joking aside, that was the back of uh, Mike's uh, bass the night you guys played your unplugged gig in... Uh, I think it was a front. I think it was the front of the bass. Was it the front? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the front oh, of the So base. that was in, yeah. in 96. That was the Metallica haircut era. Yes. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> but that night, yeah. uh, the yeah. Unplugged night, yeah. that was, apart from, I guess, one show where you guys uh, did a Kiss thing, you opened for Kiss. That was the end. Yeah, that was, it was like a one-off. That was the end. That yes. Unplugged session is one of the most legendary yeah. of those Unplugged sessions. That, that time were a big deal. Everybody was doing them. No shit. And you guys, I guess maybe along with Nirvana and, and one or two other bands, had the very, very cream mm -hmm. of those sessions from yeah. MTV. What do you remember about that night, about playing and just being together and giving those songs the acoustic treatment in front of people? I remember being surrounded by friends like you guys. You guys were all f***ing there. And we had a lot of other friends there, too. And you're right, that and the Kiss shows, I think that was it. So for a period... Was there a sense of that? Yeah, and absolutely. I mean, for a period of time, and you know this, knowing that my band's probably f***ing over and, you know, knowing that my one of my friends might be committed to going out that way, that's that's a tough thing to live with and still try to keep that internal and support the group. And also, none of us really wanted to control one another. We just wanted to f***ing exist. And if that's where somebody's going to go, then that's what they're going to do. And we all went to, through that to some degree, and I don't think I was in great shape either. I think I was not feeling too hot either by my own hand for that fucking gig i think that that's why all of that is in there because right. all of that background that i just described we were all living in that and knowing that we're coming to the end of it here unless something really drastically changes we're coming to the end really quick and i think part of that is in that right. performance as an outsider there as a, the celebration of the strength of the songs yeah for sure when they're stripped down because as you know and, and musicians know this yeah it's like when it you better be there when you, <laughs> when you be can play an acoustic <laughs> instrument there better be a fucking song there <laughs> and, right. a, and a vocal melody and a lyric that's right that that's can right. stand on its own yeah. without yeah. the volume and without the weight mm -hmm. of the electric instruments and i just remember seeing that every one of those songs were so moving mm. in their simplest form